Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today I want to talk about how the heat of battle can push a soldier to fully realize that the cause for which he is fighting is more important than his life and he's ready to sacrifice it. Case in point is the soldier pictured here. His name is John Baldwin. The Army as a first sergeant in the 74th Ohio Infantry. Baldwin, in fact, was a Southern native. He was born in Virginia and Hampshire County, which joined with other counties to form the new state of West Virginia in 1863. Baldwin's parents, also Virginia natives, had moved to Ohio when Baldwin was just a boy. He followed in his father's footsteps and became a farmer. In 1857, he married Laura Augusta Bonner, who he affectionately called Gussie. They settled on a farm in Xenia, about a two-day horseback ride from the state capital of Columbus. Had the war never happened, he very likely would have stayed a farmer and lived a quiet life with his family. But that wasn't the case. In the fall of 1861, Baldwin traded his pitchfork for a musket and enlisted as a private in Company C of the 74th. At age 34, he was one of the older men in the ranks. The average age during the war was about 26, so he was eight years older than average. He soon advanced to sergeant, and you can see him wearing his chevrons right here and his officer's sword, his non-commissioned officer's sword. And he served in this capacity when the regiment left the Buckeye State in the spring of 1862 for duty in Tennessee. Baldwin advanced to first sergeant of his company on Christmas Eve, 1862. A week later, on December 31st, he and his comrades went into action near Stones River, located just west of Murfreesboro. The 74th and its division, commanded by Major General James S. Negley, and another division led by Brigadier General Philip Sheridan, a name that I know many of you are familiar with, occupied the Union Center. After a Confederate attack crumbled the Federal right, the pair of Union divisions faced powerful but uncoordinated enemy assaults. They fell back slowly and orderly, contesting every inch of territory. Their stubborn resistance slowed the Confederate advance and prevented a rout of the army. Baldwin was pretty proud of the actions of his comrades in that day. He bragged about it in a letter to Gussie. He said, quote, we killed more rebels than any other regiment while we were at it, and more, we stood our ground until we were ordered back and would have stayed until we were all killed or captured, end quote. The area, that patch of ground in which they fought came to be known as the slaughter pen for the piles of dead scattered across the bloody battleground. The armies regrouped on New Year's Day, 1863, and went back in action on January 2nd. During this second day of fighting, Baldwin and his fellow Ohioans formed a reserve behind frontline forces under the command of Major General Thomas L. Crittenden. Baldwin wrote, quote, we lay in a kind of basin on the hillside with Stone River in our front, end quote. Meanwhile, 4,500 Confederates led by Major General John C. Breckinridge descended on the main federal line. They launched a furious attack about 4 p.m. Baldwin recalled, quote, sure enough, they drove one brigade of Crittenden then back for near a mile and were cutting them up awfully. When they came within range of our muskets, we were laying flat on the ground, so they did not see us when we raised up and fired upon them, end quote. At the same moment, an artillery battery posted near the 74th poured destructive fire into the Confederate ranks. Baldwin remembered that the enemy infantrymen were, quote, perfectly thunderstruck. They stopped and then started to run, and we charged on them, and 
of all the noises that you ever heard of thunder and lightning was nothing compared with it, end quote. Baldwin and others pursued the Confederates across the battleground strewn with dead and wounded rebels. Baldwin wrote, quote, I did not feel a particle of hatred to any one of them. In fact, I stopped as I was going along and gave one after another water out of my canteen until it was all gone. I would water one and load my gun and shoot by the other and so on all the way through and the bullets rattling like hail around me, end quote. So can you imagine Baldwin going across the battlefield, firing steadily at the Confederates and yet taking a moment to pause and take care of wounded men. It was at this time when Baldwin was selflessly putting the greater good of comrades and country ahead of his own existence. He wrote, quote, I would not have given five cents from my life from one moment to another, end quote. That, my friends, is a definition of true patriotism. Baldwin and the rest of the reserve drove the Confederates to the point from which they launched their initial attack. Darkness brought an end to the fighting and prompted the Federals to turn and retrace their steps. Baldwin observed in his letter, quote, such a sight as met our eyes as we went back over the field and woods. There was our comrades that started out with not more than two hours before, full of life and vigor, lying stiff in death. But dead and wounded rebels were lying thick five, six, and seven, piled up, would one to see it is a horrible sight, end quote. The entire Confederate army withdrew from the area during the following night. On the morning of January 4th, Baldwin reported, quote, the day was spent then hunting up the dead and burying them. They were lying all over the battlefield. Myself and two others went and examined the field. The greatest wonder is that we were not all killed. Our dead were left upon the field, stripped of all but their underclothing, and sometimes even that was taken. The rebel loss must have been tremendous. They removed the fences and buried their dead and then rebuilt the fences and scattered leaves on the graves to hide them. End quote. Baldwin reflected, quote, the country over which we fought looks as though it had been swept over with the bosom of destruction. It makes one's heart sicken as he passes over the field. When, oh, when will these rebels come back to their allegiance and to their senses, if not until they're all killed? Let it be soon, for I've got enough of war. My curiosity is perfectly satisfied, but do not feel like laying down my arms until the last armed foe expires and until the stars and stripes hang over every foot of Uncle Sam's wide domain, end quote. The Ohioans paid a high price for their actions at Stones River. Total casualties for the two days were 154 of 380 men engaged, or 41%. The senior officer of the 74th, Colonel Granville Moody, was proud of his regiment. He paid tribute to his officers and men in his official report. He wrote, quote, the brave and persistent men of my command promptly obeyed every order on that field of blood and deadly strife and contributed largely to the glorious victory which has driven the entire rebel force from their chosen field and placed us in undisputed possession of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, end quote. Colonel Moody later noted that overall Union Army Commander William S. Rosecrans, quote, said to our regiment that he must call the 74th Regiment the Fighting Regiment. Moody's men went on to prove themselves worthy of that nom de guerre given by Rosecrans, the Fighting Regiment. Those Ohioans participated in major campaigns in the Southeast. Baldwin fought in 19 total engagements. He advanced from first sergeant to second lieutenant 
and left the regiment with a disability discharge at the end of operations that resulted in the fall of Atlanta. His comrades went on to participate in Major General William T. Sherman's March to the Sea and the Carolinas Campaign. Baldwin returned to his farm in Xenia and reunited with, his, with Gussie in late 1864. The next year, she gave birth to their first child, a son they named William. Two daughters soon followed. Baldwin prospered as one of the leading farmers in his home county. He lived until 1896, dying of heart disease at about age 69. So there's a story of Baldwin, 74th Ohio Infantry, and how he got to the point where he became selfless, putting his comrades and his company and his regiment and the Union cause above his own life. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.